The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Jason Hart. You can see them walking out into the parking lot in between worship and Bible classes. A man and his wife and their two sons heading out to the car. They look just about like any other church-going family. They were walking out to the car. The father was undoing the tie and taking off his silk sports coat. Two boys were running, running around in zigzag patterns as they were making their way out to their gigantic luxury SUV. The mother was walking along, staggering really. She was holding everybody's Bibles. Her pink leather-bound copy of the Bible, her husband's Thompson chain reference, and her two sons' copies of the New Testament. Along with that was her purse, and along with some uh, drawing pads and pencils, and just about everything else in tow. As they neared the, the vehicle, the father reached into his pocket, and he grabbed the, grabbed the remote and, and unlocked the car doors. A little beep, the two boys climbed into the back into the leather-trimmed seats. One of the sons reached over and grabbed his portable, uh, his portable gaming system. The other one reached over and grabbed the remote control and turned on the, the console DVD player. The father hops into the driver's seat and he begins fidgeting with the onboard navigation to make sure that he has the right directions on his GPS in order to get to the family's favorite restaurant for after worship services. The mother, she has finally gotten everything into the car and she takes the Bibles and just shoves them right up under the seat. And then she starts speaking negatively of the worship service of the day. A song service. It was so slow today. And the sermon, it was, it was so long. And the elders, why did they have to make an announcement? You know, couldn't they, couldn't they have waited until Sunday night to talk about the church's new evangelistic campaign? And then the father, he decided to chime in just a little bit. He said, I don't understand why they have to have a scripture reading. That's ten verses long. We don't have to sit through a sermon anyway. Why do we have to stand during a scripture reading? And what is going on with the song leader's hair? He needs to fix that. He was interrupted just briefly in, in order to, to lay on the horn to scowl at the little old lady that had cut him off as he was driving out of the church's parking lot. The mother looks back at him and, and says, well, I'm glad we're not going to be coming back tonight. And he said, yeah, I'm glad we're going to the movies because I wouldn't be able to sit through another lesson on selfishness. The elder son in the back, he couldn't help but overhear what the parents were talking about. And he decided that he needed to chime in on the conversation as well. He said, I just don't understand. I don't understand why they get one of those old men that takes forever to get up to the podium to be able to say, I didn't think that man was ever going to get there. And then the younger son decided he would chime in too. Yeah, you know, I don't think it was the best church service ever, but I'd say it was pretty good seeing how we got it all for a dollar. I guess there might be some humor to that story. Think about different aspects of it. To hear the punchline. I guess there would be a little bit of humor to it if it wasn't just such a sad representation of someone 
who acts like a Christian just to keep up appearances. Yeah, it saddens me to know that there are times that I find myself stepping into that kind of role. Just to keep up appearances. Hey, after all, I'm the preacher. This is the way I'm supposed to look. This is the way that I'm supposed to act. This is the way that I'm supposed to feel. Even though I might be having a, an incredible challenge within me, something that is difficult or troublesome to me, a certain perception that I have to put on. And to see that my family is to be put on that certain appearance as well. And maybe that's something that we all tend to struggle with. Take an elder for an example. Might be an elder among our shepherds who occasionally finds himself feeling as if he has to keep up with appearances. To appear a certain way, to talk a special way, to try and herd in his, his family because he is an elder. Or maybe there's a deacon finds himself in the midst of service. I've got to do this. I've got to keep up the appearance. I've got to keep it up as if I'm, if I'm actually you know, doing this as in, in the way that I'm supposed to do it. Or perhaps the teacher that walks into the classroom and she realizes I'm not nearly as prepared as I should be but put on the guys as if they are extremely prepared and ready for class, put a smile on the face and express to the class, studying God's Word is the most fantastic thing in the world to do. Or someone who is to participate in the worship service and in, in leading us in a prayer or a scripture reading. They walk up on a stage and all of a sudden, they become very solemn and, and sincere and, and genuine. And, and their prayers, they speak, Father, just do this. And we'd ask you just to do that. And Father, you're so kind. And we just want to. And just, and just, and just. And all of a sudden, their speech before God becomes different than the way that they talk to everybody else. Or maybe there's somebody who's worshiping. They pick up a psalm book and they open it up to sing to me of heaven. Oh, this is the time that we are supposed to sing out and, and smile. So we put on this smile which is raining in our hearts. Are we just keeping up appearances for appearance sake? I do believe that there is an extent in which we should express ourselves outwardly for the encouragement of others. If I am feeling down, I... I don't want to lie about it, but I do want to be of an encouragement to others. So I might put on a stronger face or a happier face. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And sometimes it does go a long way if, let's say, suggest that we are feeling a little bit low. And as we sing, sing to me of heaven, sing that song of grace that we would put a smile on our face and hope that that would rub off on a heart of sadness.
But I'd say to you that there is a real problem. If all that we ever do whenever we come and to worship God or to serve Him or to participate in some church-wide activity or some evangelistic campaign, that we do it just to keep appearances for appearances' sake. In order that we might keep the status quo, let me ask you a question. Would you ever blatantly and boldly lie to God? Would you do that? I mean, if it were possible for you to, in the midst of a prayer, be able to visualize God Himself in His throne room with His Son at His right hand, with the Spirit there helping you to be able to say words before our Father which is in heaven. And express your faith, express your allegiance, express your fidelity, and it all be a big fat lie. Do you think that you would ever want to do that? Do you think that you ever could? I don't think it's spiritually possible. If you were to, go, if you were to try to go to God with that type of attitude, you, you wouldn't even make it to the throne room. But if it was possible for you to be able to do that, would you willingly lie before God? Folks, we would say that's a very serious offense. You know, why would anybody ever want to do that? But yet the real reality of it, the sad reality, is that when we are here together, if all we're ever doing is just keeping up appearances for appearances' sake, our heart is far from God, even though our lips are offering up a sacrifice of praise to Him, We're lying to ourselves. You know what they say about it? If you say something enough, people begin to believe it. You convince yourself of a lie long enough, you begin to believe it to be a truth. Sometimes you portray it enough in front of others, they start to believe it to be a truth. And then when you say it enough before God, guess what? He doesn't see it as a truth. Because God always sees the lie. There's no creature that is hidden from His sight. All are before His presence. He's able to peer into the deepest parts of our hearts and knows where our true allegiance is. He knows whether we're here just because we're interested in Jesus or if we really want to follow Jesus. He knows if we're here because our desire is to honor Him and to glorify Him, or if we're here because we think there's something fantastic about portraying Christianity. In Acts chapter 5, we're told of a story about a couple. They were individuals who were just like everybody else. They were Christians. They were giving just like everybody else. They were worshiping just like everybody else. They were brothers and sisters in Christ. They were studying the, the Scriptures just like everybody else. And they made a decision that they would give in a great way, just like so many others were doing. But in the process of giving, they made a fatal error. They had sold a piece of property, 
and then began to tell everybody how much they sold it for. And it was a lie. Now this wasn't a, wasn't a, a, a thing where the, the husband had lied about it. No, he conspired with his wife. And together they lied about it, kept back some of the money from the, the sale themselves, then came before the apostles and said, here it is. Look at what we have done. We have sold the property for this amount of money, and this amount of money is what we are laying at your feet. They didn't have to give all of it. They weren't required to do this. So why did they do it in this way with these motives? My suggestion is that they were keeping up appearances. Folks, it is a spiritual fatality to try and appear like everybody else. I realize it's okay for us to appear like everybody else when everybody else is in the right. But it's a spiritual fatality to try and appear like everybody else when everybody else is in the right and your heart is in the wrong place. Now sometimes we give Ananias and Sapphira a bad rap. And that certainly is deserving as we look at the, at the conclusion of this story. But let's understand that these, these two individuals, they were just like everybody else. They were brothers and sisters in Christ. You look back at Acts chapter 4 and beginning in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Ananias and Sapphira were a part of that group. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace came upon them all. And Ananias and Sapphira were in that group. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any one of them had need. Ananias and Sapphira were a part of that group. And so they came up with the idea. A lot of other folks doing this. Why don't we do it too? Let's take a look at verses 1 through 6. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Ananias and Sapphira, they were just like everybody else, but because they chose to lie. They didn't lie to men. They lied to God. God was able to peer deeply into their hearts and, they, and He knew that although their lips spoke of something that was great, their heart was far from Him. That was the warning that Jesus gave to the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15 and verses 8 and 9 that was read for the Scripture reading. He was quoting from Isaiah. And there's a far greater meaning than what we would apply it to us today. But Jesus says, These people draw near to Me with their lips. The Hebrew writer describes our songs as a sacrifice of our lips. 
We pray to God and we speak out and we speak from our lips. But Jesus said, but their heart is far from me. It's a spiritual fatality to appear like everyone else. It's also a spiritual fatality to try, be, try to appear to be better than everybody else. So this happened to Ananias. Well, Sapphira comes in about three hours later, and this is what Luke tells us. After an interval of about three hours, the wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. You better believe it. I think that is a great understatement right there in verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church. Let's come back to that in just a second. You notice the very first word in chapter 5 and verse 1? Look at that word. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. However, yet, in contrast, let's go back to chapter 4 at the very conclusion, beginning in verse 36. Then Joseph, who was also called the apostle Barnabas, which was son of encouragement, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. How interesting it is that a number of individuals were recognized as having selling pieces of property and then bringing the money and laying it at the apostles' feet. And then there is Barnabas, the one known as the encourager. And special highlight is placed upon him for selling the land. I don't know if he is highlighted because this was an, a large sum of property or if it was just because it was Barnabas. Could have been both. But Barnabas is highlighted as having sold a piece of property and then bringing all of the proceeds of that and laying it at the apostles' feet. Again, this was not something that was required. He didn't have to give all of it. Just as Peter had expressed to Ananias in verse 4, then this is your property, you can do with it whatever you want to. But Barnabas brought all of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. And then chapter 5 begins, but Ananias and Sapphira. Look at all the praise that Barnabas is getting. Did you see the way that, that he wears his clothing? Do you see the way that he walks just right? Did you see the way that he very in a very special way, laid it humbly at the apostles' feet. You know what? We can do that too. We can appear just like Barnabas. We can dress in clothes just like him. We can put on a face just like him. We can sell a piece of property. And then whenever we get the money, we can give it to the apostles. But, but, how about we keep some of it for ourselves? The only problem with that, if we do that, then we'll not appear as great as everybody else. We won't appear as great as Barnabas. So let's say how much that we have sold the property for, and then we give that, but keep some of it to ourselves. It was the act. It was the motivation, it was the heart of a masquerade. Not to just appear like everybody else, but to appear as great as some other great servant 
and potentially to be highlighted what one would think would be greater than everybody else. Peter had asked a question to Ananias back in verse 4. Why has Satan filled your heart? Do you remember what was said in verse 11? Great fear came upon the whole church. I don't think that was just because they realized the incredible power and all-seeing eye of God. I think they all came to the understanding that they are humans and that they can make mistakes too. It was a good fear because it moved them in the right direction. It was an understanding. It was a realization that we need to make sure that we have our hearts in the right place. We need to make sure that we're not just doing this for appearance sake. Peter asked Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Remember the last time that we read in the Bible about Satan filling somebody? Filled his heart. We talked about him last week. It was a man by the name of Judas. And even as Judas was having his feet washed by Jesus, he kept up the appearance. Even as Jesus was telling his apostles, there's someone, one of you is going to betray me. And everybody was saying, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? Everybody was joining in. Lord, is it I? I think that for 11 of them, that was a genuine question. But there was Judas over to the side. I better keep up with the appearance. Lord, is it I? Folks, if Satan can fill the heart of a Judas, a man chosen by the Lord as an apostle, a man who walked and talked, with the Son of God. And Satan can fill the heart of an excited Christian at a moment when Christianity was at a mountaintop, was at a high of excitement. Satan can fill their heart to appear like everybody else. Don't you think it's possible? That even though maybe we have lied to ourselves and have convinced ourselves, don't you think it's possible that Satan can fill our hearts too? Sometimes sing the song, Is Your Heart Right With God? We sing that song not with the words, is is your hairdo right to God? Is your suit right with God? Is your tie tied on correctly with God? Do you have your pants buckled up right with God? Do you carry your Bible in a very special way close to your heart? Is the way that you carry your Bible right with God? Is the way that you open up a psalm book or look at the screen above you right with God? Is the way that you walk to Bible class, is it right with God? Is the way that you bow your head in a prayer, is that right with God? That's not what we sing. The writer of that song understood that what is supposed to be right with God is right here. But if Satan has filled our heart, it cannot be right. So I ask you this morning, would you peer deeply into your heart and try to look for yourself? Is that a heart that is filled with Satan or is it a heart that is filled with God? Make the right appearance. Answering the Lord's invitation this morning. Asking for the prayers of the church. Let us help you resist the devil so God can draw near to a true heart.
we can help any of you, would you please come while we stand and sing? This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient word.